Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the first session for the day. Uh, in this session, uh, in the chair, we have Professor Avishek Parui, uh, who teaches English at IIT Madras and is the Associate Fellow of the UK uh, Higher Education Academy. He researches on memory studies, medical humanities, mascul masculinity studies, and critical theory. He is the author of Postmodern Literatures and is currently contracted with Roman and Littlefield for his second book titled Culture and the Literary Matter, Liter and Literary Matter, Metaphor, Memory. He is one of the faculty coordinators of the Memory Studies Research Network at IIT Madras. Uh, welcome, sir. And uh, I hand it over to uh, sir so that we can start the proceedings for the day. Thank you. Yes, uh, absolutely. So thank you very much for inviting me. So we have some very recent papers. I'm just gonna find, uh, yes. So the first paper we have is by Umar. Hello. Yeah. Has, has Umar joined the session? Yes. Uh, yeah, so we have Umar Nizaruddin, uh, Arpita Sen, and then we have Indrani Das Gupta. Uh, and the final paper would be from Ajit Cherian. So if I could just follow the sequence which is uh, in the conference schedule. Uh, so Umar, if you're okay to go first, we'll go with you first. Uh, so Umar is an assistant professor of English at Government College uh, Madhapali, University of Calicut. And the title of the paper is uh, Fill in the Silver Dots, Cognitive Militarism, Populist Healing Practices, and the Rise of the neo gestalt Group. So just uh, one small thing. I mean, if it's okay with all the participants, can we have the Q&A at the end of the session? Uh, if that's okay with everyone. I'm also uh, happy to do it at the end of each paper, whichever works best for the organizers. Yeah. Uh, Avishik, what we decided was, and this is what we found useful because, you know, sometimes people, uh, you know, lose track of the paper. So what, what yeah. they do is that while the paper is being read, they post questions in the chat box and sure. then, uh, you know, we take up the questions and move on to the next. Sure. Absolutely. Sounds, sounds very sensible. Uh, okay, Umar, so if you're ready, uh, you can start your session, please. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Has Umar got logged off? I believe Umar is having some issues. So mm -hmm. until then, we can ask Ajit to maybe start. Yeah, let's do that. Ajit? Okay. Uh, so we'll start with Ajit Cherian, uh, who is an English language instructor uh, in the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, IIT Delhi. And the title of his paper is um, Identities and Intensities, Comics as Blocks of Sensation. So Ajit, if you're ready, we can start the session. Um, so, yeah, so uh, as mentioned, the title of my paper, uh, the title that I'm uh, paper that I'm presenting today is titled uh, Identities and Intensities, Comics as Blocks of Sensation. Multiplicity in Comics. This paper studies comics not just as a visual medium, but also as haptic and intermedial, as blocks of sensation, a compound of affects and percepts, actual and virtual, space and time, self and other. As opposed to the bioocularity or closure in comics, which regulate comics as excess and polyphony, I will study the medium through its scattering, distribution, and coagulation of sensations that propagate a radical openness. This, I will argue, affirms the impossibility of representation and identity in comics, and instead allows for an exploration of the rich aesthetic and conceptual pot potentials of comics, and intensive or collective sites, as intensive or collective sites of becoming, that are drawn, seen, assembled, remembered, imagined, and sensed. The plurality of expression and distribution of sensations inherent in comics simultaneously disrupt and deny any possibility of an absolute or closed system of identity and knowledge. These multimodal and sensory texts par excellence not only fragment a priori systems of classification, identification, and thought, but in doing so offer the possibility of new ways to connect, organize, feel, and think anew. 
Unfortunately, the study of comics often ignores this experimental and experiential labor and favors the habitual reductive and inferential labor of closure, which is the phenomenon of observing the parts but perceiving the whole. By inferring what we already know or think we know through what is given, comics are reduced to the question of validity of the truth claim made by the image text where connections, experiments, expression, organization, affects, and percepts are subordinate to meaning, knowing, and human agency. I argue that comics, especially Joe Sarko's comics in this case, disrupt this logic of closure and instead advocate an open system of sense-making which traverses many conceptions of self, identity, regimes of knowledge, and scopic regimes. Similarly, Although on the one hand, Marianne Hirsch's term biocularity, referring to the visual verbal, verbal conjunction rather than its disjunction, dislodges verbal language from its privileged position in matters of expression. On the other hand, it transforms the visual into a verbal code and vice versa. By enforcing linguistic and epistemic tyranny, the autonomy of the two sensory planes or subjects of expression, lexis and opsis, is lost. Biocularity reduces comics to a cipher or rebus, which espouses the closure of meaning and a demystification of some ultimate truth that lies trapped within the artist's intentionality, which the literate reader has to unearth. Through a clever rearticulation of the hermeneutics of suspicion, Hirsch looks for meaning beyond the comic, but never in the visual, haptic, or sensory that is imminent to the medium and possess a non-human agency. Instead of exploring the varied perceptual modalities and sensory multitudes, Hirsch sees comics as a mere symbolic stand-in for an originary lack of meaning. By assuming that difference must entail, uh, entail separability, Hirsch views comics in terms of what lies beyond, a complete organism formed by adding its parts. But as Edward Said reminds us, comics played havoc with the logic of A plus B plus C plus D the logic of an addition of parts post its enforced separation. By extending Said's idea, I argue that comics and by exception, uh, extension, its consum conception of the self does not allow the above mentioned accumulative and organizational logic of addic addition, but rather should be seen architecturally as transversal organizations of multimodal elements in an asymmetric flow of difference, producing new becomings. What comics then offer is not a spectacle or shock of sight, as proposed by Hirsch, but rather a shock of the senses, a shock of thought. Section 2, Comics as Blocks of Sensation. Since biocularity and closure designate the impossibility of the radically new, we must now look for new vocabulary and syntax for comics and the trauma, histories, and resistance in it. For this, we must first view comics as, me as a medium capable of breakdowns, scattering, distribution, and coagulation, propagating a radical openness. They are smooth and nomadic spaces of composition and contestation, or blocks of sensation, a compound of percepts and affects. A site of the possible, a common zone or passage where power, identity, and representation are reconfigured through encounters and are capable of producing collective sites of becoming, and simulations of the self. As the site of articulating the possible, and as a counterpoint to the negative difference of negative difference or indifference of identity, these blocks of sensation produce intensity. Intensity think not in terms of binaries or closure, but is an organizing or reorganizing force that operates below the surface of things, events, and even identities. It is an indivisible heterogeneous multiplicity that produces difference capable of transforming the nature of the whole. A plane of consistency, but never a plane of capture. For Deleuze, if identity becomes the precondition on which difference is traced or projected, projected then such a difference would be forced into a previously, uh, then such a difference would be, open quotes, forced into a previously established identity when it has been, pla uh, when it has been placed on the so slope of the identical, which makes it reflect or desire identity and necessarily takes it where identity wants it to go, namely into the negative, difference and repetition. 
the collective sites of becoming and simulation of the self in Sarko's comics will be explored through his figure of the defeatist, which enables lines of flight and encounters. As an intensity, it does not segregate or ghettoize complex identities, despite the nature of Sarko's conflict zones being as such. This figure is an attempt to escape essentialization, but never the question of the essence. It forms a system with an order and vitality of its own and is placed alongside and within sites of conflict such as Iraq, Auschwitz, and Somme, a site of composing the self where the reader encounters not just themselves, but also reorganizes themselves in a place, uh, in a time, place, and order of their own making. It is the sense, the figure, it is the sensible form related to sensation. It acts immediately upon the nervous system, which is of the flesh. This is a quote from uh, Logic and Sensation. An attempt, to, uh, an attempt to escape figuration and to go beyond the realm of sight to the realm of sensation, which is made palpable in the image. Section three, the defeatist. Somewhere in America, under the influence of the live telecast of the Gulf War and exasperated with the twisted and turgid debates uh, of uh, of live television, Joe Sacco was experiencing something new and undergoing metamorphosis. A strange intensity had gripped him, leaving, barely, leaving behind barely any trace of himself, but a block of sensation, a vague semblance, a figure. Notes from a defeatist, a brutal, non-representational and explosive two-page comic is where we first encounter the defeatist. Here, we witness a cadaverous, flaccid, and stark naked body resembling Sako only in its countenance and long punk hair, wandering through, the trenches of, wandering through the trenches of war and mounds of destruction, desiring the destruction of its own subjectivity. For the very, from the very first panel, the absence and merging of the Rekita thief, which is uh, the narrative voiceover box, uh, speech and thought bubbles, which usually separates Sako the narrator from Sako the character, makes the narrator author indistinguishable from the character and suggests an, uh, suggests an, uh, an absence of narrative distance in the diegetic world. As a block of sensation, the defeatist also becomes indistinguishable from the desiccated body or the Muslim and the surreal warscapes it drifts through. Thus by, rendering the act of thus, by rendering the act of narration and the content of narration as inseparable from the other, Sako suggests a process of intensive transformation of the TV consuming subject caught in the limbo of a series of perpetual presence. Since the defeatist remains an emergent subjectivity or a zone of intensity that is sensed, what Sako then offers through his comic is a processual account of reality one that exists between the perceiving subject and the perceived object, which in this context is partially mediated through live television. This processual account of reality transforms the limbo or the illusion of liveness into blocks of sensations that have neither beginning nor end, neither past nor future, but become an experience of simultaneity, both product and process, an ethical temporality and intensity that operates in an atemporal non-space. In the final panel, what he calls the image of war, the defeatist, uh, in the final panel, what he calls the image of war, the defeatist stands suspended on a diving board, hanging at the, uh, hanging at the precipice of thought and sensation, peering into a huge circular pit brimming with crashed helicopters, human bones, flesh, blood, and viscera of the future. Unlike Cleese Angelus Nuvis, whose face is turned towards the past, the defeatist face, the debris, uh, the defeatist, uh, the defeatist faces the debris of the future, or the future reality of threat, or an anticipatory reality, similar to similar to the one that Saddam had called for. We will make them swim in their own blood. Here, the panel, as well as the image of the defeatist, hangs like a question mark, suspended in time. Only this time, the question of an ethical temporality is posed to the reader. What remains then of the defeatist is a morphogenetic model of pure becoming, articulated as an ethical temporality. To sum up, this study has attempted to demonstrate that Joe Sacco, 
through the use of pers uh, perceptual modalities and haptic multitude inherent in comics, constructs blocks of sensation. These blocks of sensation resist fixity and are made sensible through the figure of the defeatist. By turning this comic into an effective and nomadic site of composition and contestation, Sarko constructs a technological individuation, an emergent subjectivity that visibilizes affects, sensations, and the process of individuation, i.e. The, uh, the effects of the choreographed live telecast of war that invisibilized more than it ever revealed. Thank you very much. Uh, I would also, uh, before I end this session, um, probably I could share my screen and... Um, Uh, if it's not working, Ajit, it's fine. I mean, you, right, you wanted right. to show some, uh, show some. I mean, I'm sure all of us have read, uh, you know, uh, Joe Sacco's uh, comics. I'm sure everybody would be familiar with what you're referring to. So, Vishik. Right, right. Sure. Okay, thank you very much, Ajit. There was a really interesting uh, paper talking about the corporeality of the comic. And I was thinking of the distributed mode of cognition that comics can offer. Uh, so, I just opened up the... Uh, flow for any questions. I believe there is uh, some accumulated in the chat box. So if I could just request um, uh, Momita. Or yes, Mr. yes, sir. I'm here. Um, so I don't see any possible questions in the chat box as of now, mm -hmm. but there is this comment and uh, it is thanking Ajit sir for this wonderful presentation. And uh, there is also a question with it. Could you discuss a bit about the materiality of the space on the page that Sarko employs? Okay, um, materiality of the space as in uh, uh, the organization of the Misam Posh or uh, uh, where Sako borrows from. Uh, uh, these, are, these are different questions um, uh, and, and, it depends on, um, and, and it depends on his field. It depends on what kind of uh, uh, comic that Sako is drawing. Mostly he's, he, he does reportage, right? Uh, so his images, uh, the, the materiality of the page is constructed uh, through memories, it is constructed through archive um, um, to create a process which he himself calls uh, informed imagination. Right. So uh, Sako goes to the uh, UN archives in New York. He goes to uh, archives in Israel and Palestine. Um, when he comes to India, he speaks to Dalit activists and politicians. Uh, so it is a combination of both ethnography, uh, archival work, uh, and most importantly, what I've tried to argue in my paper, uh, that his most important methodology is, is the medium is comics itself. Uh, how comics and the haptic quality of comics and how uh, he constructs, reconstructs these memories and often forgotten minor histories are more important uh, personally, um, uh, um, are, are, are the most important uh, ways of expressing these uh, archival documents and minor histories. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ajit, yeah. sir. There's another question from Fezan. Mm -hmm. uh, interesting paper. Do you think blocks of sensation need implotment in the sense record uses of sensation in order to make sense of sensation? Otherwise, what would be the condition of intelligibility of such blocks? Okay, could you, could you please repeat that question once again? Yes, uh, yes, definitely, yeah. sir. Do you think blocks of sensation needs implotment in the sensory core uses of sensation in order to make sense of sensation? Otherwise, what would be the condition of intelligibility of such blocks? Right. Emplotment, uh, not necessarily. Uh, I mean, if there is any sort of emplotment, I would say that uh, Sako's primary method uh, is travel, uh, where he jumps from episode to episode. He 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 just arrives, uh, or the word that he uses himself is is jump into the thick of things. You know, just like a journalist. This is where his journalistic training comes. Uh, comes in handy. So he jumps into the thick of things and lets himself uh, lets himself be carried away. 
uh, by the people he meets on the ground. And that is primarily the employment over here. But Sako, we must remember that is not just a, a, a comics journalist, you know, though he um, though he pioneered this field, he's not just a comics journalist, he's also uh, an underground journalist. He's, he's done a lot of work uh, which is quite abstract and non-representational. So I'm trying to uh, so I'm trying to look at all of these together and for say for example in notes from the defeatist that I was talking about, I wanted to show you the uh, uh, images. Uh, it is indexed, you know, it is indexed uh, like I'd mentioned in, in the Gulf War. Uh, it is in it indexes uh, the Battle of Somme uh, or the Battle of Ain uh, in France, and it um, uh, what is the other thing? Uh, there is Auschwitz. There are references to Auschwitz, but he is more concerned with the construction of these images itself, both in live television and how he constructs it in his comics. So uh, uh, I I don't know if uh, that answers your question, but. Uh, Okay, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. Yeah. Uh, th since we are on restricted time, I would like our Honorable Chair, Vishesh, sir, sure. to please take yeah. over. Yeah. Uh, thanks very much, Ajit. I mean, I'm sure there are many questions brewing in all of our minds, but for the uh, purpose of time, we need to move on. But that was really fascinating. It got me thinking of many things as well. And hopefully we can have a conversation later about this. Uh, so next up, we have uh, Indrani Das Gupta, who is an assistant professor in the Department of English uh, Maharaja Agrisan College, DU, and the title of the paper is Reinscribing the World, Reflections on Sense-Making and Navigating the Networks of Global Capitalism. Uh, so, Indrani, if you're ready, you could... Uh, yes, question, thank you so much, sir, and thank you to the organizing team for having me here. So, I begin with my paper. Oscar Wilde, in his essay, The Soul of Man Under Socialism, said, Map of the world that does not include utopia is not worth even glancing at, for it leaves out the one country at which humanity is always landing. This paper is not about utopia, but about imagined and alternate worlds that opens up possibility for humanity to manifest utopia. To unpack the meaning surrounding worlds and worlding and world building, this paper shall draw inspiration from Martin Heidegger, while the reinscription in the title of my paper draws attention to Gayatri Chakravarti's Pevak's vulgar use of Heidegger's conception of worlding. A key conception in Heidegger's philosophy, worlding develops in relation to his idea of Dasein, as explored in his monumental philosophical book, Being in Time. Dasein, described by Heidegger as being in the world, rejects the binary reification of subject and object. Instead, subject and world are read as, world as objects of inquiry, are read as locked in a register of interdependence in relational terms what Delica stated. Subject is constituted by relation in the world. Heidegger's understanding of world as a verb instead of as a noun suggests an ongoing generative process of becoming, functioning as Rat Singh elaborates as an opening of meaning. The conception of worlding drawn from Spivak grapples with the idea of othering and alterity constituted within dominant institutions and processes. Spivak's understanding of worlding is framed in a violent epistemic knowledge production of the world, localized in imperialist practices and mechanisms that forces the natives to see themselves as the other. In an interview with Elizabeth Gross titled Criticism, Feminism and the Institution, Spivak defines worlding as a texting, textualizing, a making into art, a making into an object to be understood. This allows us to see the implication of worlding in narratives, making representation and reading as crucial to reinscribing or reworlding the margins that had been worlding, worlded as Rosalie Roshner says, transparent calculus. Reading worlding as fertile sites of imaginative possibilities and adapting from Heidegger's and Spivak's critical positions, worlding in my paper functions as an active critical intervention that negotiates and engages with hegemonic neoliberal capitalist networks where the natives, global south, third world are still reified as others and hence subject to control. Interdependence, relationality, unmasking, making, unmaking, figure as key operational terms to decode worlding and to resist the totalizing practices of globalization. This paper explores worlding as the means to comprehend how speculative narratives like science fiction and science fiction fantasy speak to us in ethical political terms. 
speculative narratives, I opine, is best suited to embody the operations of worlding as it invites us to observe, critique, and embody the potentialities of social imaginary and narratives. The complexity, dynamism, and worlding as a situated mode of experimentation that shall navigate between local, global, and local shall be studied in three texts, Vandana Singh's two short stories titled With Fate Conspire and Requiem from the same anthology, Ambiguity Machines, and other stories published in 2018, and Summit Basu's The Game World Triology, published from 2004 to 2007, through three themes, worlding as a ditto to stay in the trouble, Welding as unmaking of heroes and welding a turn of the planetary imagination. These texts, through the revelation of stories, furnishing of a world, I argue, registers a multiplicity of assemblages and multilogical meanings that, to quote Ekman, expands the worlds by joining different realities together. Unquote. So I begin with my first section. The first story in this collection, with feet conspire, is set in near future Kolkata. And except the high rise, and for except the high rise skyscrapers, all is nearly submerged under rising sea waters. The apocalyptic representation of the city, flirted by rising sea levels, mirrors the rapid climactic changes being faced by a contemporary world. A group of scientists have invented a machine that could save the world from this disaster. However, this time looping machine allows only a select few individuals to glimpse into few moments in the past, which we are informed is necessary to save our future. And it is to empower the machine to work according to its predetermined utility that Gargi, the protagonist of the story, an inconspicuous figure of history, is allowed to live in the skyscrapers by this team of scientists. Gargi is a poor slum dweller whose family has been lost to this deluge, in her own words, she is an illiterate woman, bred in the back streets and alleyways of old Kolkata, of no more importance than a cockroach. She has been entrusted with the task of reading a particular moment in history to spy through the machine and discover the activities of an exiled king, come a poet, Wajid Ali Shah, living in 1856 in Mitya in Kolkata. Gargi has been asked to discover if any poems of this Nawab of Odd, has, who has been exiled from his home, by the British colonial administration have remained unrecorded. The mention of 1856 brings to mind the Sepoy mutiny of 1857 that has often been read as inauguration of, to quote Maniko Swami, territorial colonialism, unquote, an instantiation of colonial modernity that had ennobled, enabled Europe, as Sudipta Kaviraj argues, to bring the rest of the world under its colonial control, unquote. However, Gargi, Instead of focusing on Wajid Ali Shah, whom she labels as a VP man, she becomes absorbed with the surreptitious activities of an upper class Hindu housewife living in the same time period, Rasindri Devi, the author of Omar Jiban, whom we know better as having established the female autobiographical tradition in India. In order to continue in our task of knowing and figuring out what Rasindri Devi is pursuing, Gargi starts lying and constructing her own version of poetry which she passes off as Wajid Ali Shah's creative output. Her deviation from a stated task is where I argue her welding operations unfold. Her hermeneutical act of reading Wajid Ali Shah is entangled and interconnected with multiple timelines, several narratives drawn both from her personal reminiscences as well as a newfound understanding of what Rasandri Devi is engaged in. Her recognition of Rasandri's privileged upper-class status, however, does not deter Gargi to share a world with her as she says, now I know that she senses something. She always looks up at me, puzzled as to how a corner of the ceiling appears to call to her. Does she hear me or see some kind of image? I don't know. I keep telling her not to be afraid that I'm from the future and that she is famous for her writing. Gargi's ability to read, to connect and to enter the world and share the secret of Rasundri Devi, I read as performing an affective alliance a term I borrow from Kathleen Stewart and Lawrence Grossberg that suggests multiple and complex forms of belonging. Her relationality with Rasundri entails a worldview that breaks free of caste practices, encapsulating a new gynocritical tradition. Gargi's opening out to Rasundri enables a collaboration that is mutual, relational, and co-constitutive, as Heidegger elaborates in his concept of Darcy. This is a world that opens out framed in an idiom of care and compassion and thus remakes the future. 
At the end, Gargi chooses a liberation and a question posed to the scientist. I don't count, do I? Enables the transformation of her own future. Her refusal to participate in this divine making process of playing Kalki, of saving the world, emerges as a key intervention to refuse the totalizing and homogenizing vision of the world as underscored by globalizing tendencies where voices of people like Gargi are silenced. I read her refusal as sting with the trouble, a phrase I borrow from Donna Haraway, who defined it as, quote, learning to be truly present, not as a vanishing pivot between awful or ethnic pasts and apocalyptic or salvific futures, but as mortal critters entwined in myriad unfinished configurations of places, times, matters, meanings, unquote. Gargi's lies are, I, I argue, is a diversion, a ditcher of staying in trouble, of time that doesn't flow in a straight line, it meanders, and thus resists the totalizing and hegemonic impulses of globalization. I move to the second section. Summit Basu's The Game World Trilogy, comprising of three books, The Simokin Prophecies, Manticore's Secret, The Anwabal's Revelation, has often been termed as the first science fiction fantasy published in India. Basu's trilogy plays with different genres, multiple eras, and various voices to explore a range of themes bordering on nation, heroism, language, sexuality, power, and globalization. Traversing vast terrains from legends to folk tales, Harry Potter series, Lord of the Rings, Liu Carroll's Alice in Wonderland, covering the two classical epics like Ramayana and the Mahabharata, and drawing upon the structures of colonial empires like the British and the multinational corporations of the globalized world, Basu's trilogy, in adapting and borrowing from the earlier text of Western and Eastern literature functions as a dynamic site of contestation and intervention. The trilogy lacks a definite plotline, and all we get are incomplete stories, fragmentary identities, and dissolution of the boundaries of the rational and the irrational, the aesthetic and the mundane. One of the main characters in the novel, Dan Grimm, an anagram of Mingna, the classical epic Ramayana's most celebrated villains, is here projected as more than a memory. Don Grimm belongs to the Rakshas community, the community who are categorized in the present day world of coal, a fictionalized, fictionalized world where the actions occur as brute creatures, aggressive in nature, and wild in their very imagination. Don Grimm has been dead for the past two centuries, and his diary is found by his son, who is unaware of his parentage. The diary is written, however, in Ravian language, equivalent to the most cultured race of all times, akin to the elves. The interesting part is Dan Grimm's son, Grin, is thought of as belonging to a race that is postulated as non-human. The diary instructs Kirin to return to the Dark Lord's palace where he shall reclaim the knowledge of who he actually is. When Kirin follows the injunction of the diary in its totality, it's revealed to him that his father, Dan Grimm, had assumed the shape of Naraka, a Ravian, and had gotten married to his love, a Ravian princess, Isara. He continued to adorn his doppelganger identity to the rest of his life before being killed in an epic war between all the races supporting Don Grimm, the Dark Lord, and the races led by Ravians out to protect the innocent civilians from these primitives. In the possibility of recovery of Kirin's recognition of his true lineage, it reveals the contradictions in this narrative and encapsulates the idea of worlding. World is not about oneself, it is projecting on multiple selves adorning masks that straddle different timelines and multiplicity of spaces. Worlding embodies, as Helbig suggests, sites and residues of uncertainty, openness, and indeterminacy. The fact that this diary is written in a language which is considered archaic opens up the issue of translation as the carrying over of languages, histories, and stories that also implies a reinterpretation, as said by Murthy. The diary of Dark Lord, like Tom Riddle's alas Voldemort's diary from Harry Potter series, is a long lost memory that seeks to valorize a specific illustration of masculine hero. The main thrust of the narrative is provided in the formulation of a hero through a quest. John J. Timuran describes in other worlds the fantasy genre that quests sought to discover a locus of value and meaning. The prophesied hero in this novel is a character by the name of Aswin, who is the prince of Avranti, a fictional place, whom gods would look after, for he was a hero a chosen one, a person to whom things happen, many things. However, he is killed midway in the novel and is resurrected as one of the members of the army of Scorpion King as a zombie. We are later informed gods prefer zombie as they're easy to control. 
His role is not only diminished, but even the traditional sayings, myths are questioned because the prophecy turns out to be spoken by a character who is both the anti-hero and a hero, Dan Graham. The Ravians and the Rakshas believed as oppositional categories in their terms, in terms of their figurations is now debunked. How do we read Dan Graham? A Ravian celebrated warrior or the brutal, dark, evil Rakshas enemy? Or do we read him as Kirin, come to fulfill the prophecy enunciated 200 years back? Don Graham's diary opens up the world as one of almost infinite entanglements, collaborations, co-dependencies, co-determinations, displacements, multi-centricities, and exclusions. Uh, Indrani, if I could just uh, request you to wind up. Uh, we are nearing Yeah, the just uh, one yeah. last two paragraphs. Sure, sure. sure. <clears throat> so I'm now move on to the last section. Requiem an original story from the same collection as with Feet Conspire can be understood as a critical intervention in the discourse of anthropogenic and climate change, which while it explores how humans as collective geologic agents have radically altered the earth as Deepesh Chakravarti discusses, is yet moving towards a willingness to imagine the future where humans are just one of the many agents of change. Set in a futuristic world, Requiem describes the world of the great melt, the rising sea levels, changing of the whole biosphere, and destruction of biocommunities, all of which uncannily mirrors our contemporary ecological crisis. The story begins with Varsha, a researcher from Patna, India, and pursuing her studies in VR and artificial intelligence from Boston, who travels to Alaska, Alaska in US, to collect the belongings of her aunt, dead aunt, uh, Rima, an engineer who had been working with the indigenous community of Inupiaq at Alaska. She had died in a storm along with her partner, James Young, an indigenous native of the Inupiaq community and a marine biologist. Here she becomes acquainted with the work of her aunt Rima and James who are trying to understand, learn and engage with the language of bowhead whales and other marine species. Through a realization of what her aunt and her partner were seeking to comprehend and the recognition of how, High metropolises and high rises with the technologies of T-Rex with the conflicting agendas in the name of ecological preservation has led to a loss and a gradual decline of a worldview. Varsha states, you have destroyed everything I took for granted about the world. This recognition of human and human activities as being the pivot of all meanings of the world now gives way to a worlding of the world denominated by new ways of understanding a field imaginary where whales and dolphins have sophisticated language and they are the speakers and makers of the world. Requiem reminds us how the parakeet, the paria dogs, the tulsi plant in the courtyard of Varsha's Patna's home is connected with the Inupia community, the bowhead whales, and other marine species of the Arctic. His stories are never ending like the stories co-written by Varsha and her aunt, written over a period of time, that recreates a world that is continually in formation, becoming with interspecies and intraspecies. Mm -hmm. Stories have a never and ending I will have to interrupt. Just have uh, the Please. last minute, maybe. Uh, yeah, just one last minute. Yeah. yeah exclaiming together, this I am made of many things, mother's milk, fruit of guava and mango trees, and also bowhead whale. Welding, I argue, brings near the potential and the probable, the knowable and the unknowable together. It includes an element of translation and comparison that accompanies an ongoing dialogue and intracultural translation whose essence lies in its shifting alliances, a continual sense of mobility, and a digressive understanding of our relationship with the world. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Indrani. I, I do apologize for uh, sort of shutting it down. It's a very interesting paper, but we have to abide by uh, the norms of time. Unfortunately, it's a very temporal uh, structure. Uh, I understand. Time temporality. But it was very, very interesting. So could I have, uh, could I request the uh, repertoires to open up the questions, if there are any, please? Yeah, Indranidhi, thank you so much for your paper. As always, it is fresh with ideas and vibrant in nature. And as you said, we are supposed to rethink and reflect on um, your quote, worldling is not just about oneself. Uh, but unfortunately, we are not being able to take any questions right now. Okay. So uh, you can answer them through the chat box. Uh, we will, right. however, have to move forward uh, with yeah, our next sure, presentation. Sure. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Indrani. Uh, so we have the uh, next two presentations, Umar Nazaruddin and Arpita Sen. Uh, so Umar, do you want to go first? I think I saw you enter the room. Uh,
Umar, are you around? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Yeah. Yes, wonderful. So, so Umar is an assistant professor of Department of English, Government College, uh, Madhapali, University of Calicut. And the title of the paper is uh, Filling the Silver Dots, uh, Cognitive Militarism, Populist Healing Practices, and the Rise of the neo Gestalt Group. So Umar, if you're ready, you could start the session, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good morning. Uh, the Western Buddhist mode of meditation gained popularity historically due to its opposition to inane ritual. Meditation and self-awareness acquired a certain cachet due to the selfless pursuit of wisdom by individuals who were perspicacious enough to create a global network of practitioners and life coaches and communities of meditation and self-awareness through subtle observation. Anicca and Dukkha are concepts have, that have come into prominence like never before. Anicca is an idea uh, whose uh, time has come, so to speak. Anicca, the catchphrase across academia, art binales, art fora, and spirituality needs introspection. Everyday spirituality gradually melts its loads into the thicker description of a mythical backstory. The folk is conflated with the mythological, with the result that the egalitarian folk tales become trapped within the mesh of grander epic narratives, such as in the case of the Ayappa Temple in Shabatimala in Kerala, where the very folk popular same-sex origin story of the uh, deity was turned into a tool of misogyny in order to prohibit women from entering the temple premises. The invention of a tradition of punkish masculine purity was cited to offer theological support for this thesis. This makes one question the very category of tradition. The misappropriation and misinterpretation of Buddhism happens in the realm of global phenomenological theory also. In Dukkha, there is no self and no liberation from suffering either. The original selflessness of Buddhism lies beyond thought or articulation. This is misinterpreted as an instrument of hate and self-aggrandizement. Therefore, the quest for an egalitarian future is lazily intermeshed with prevailing affective ideologies of hatred, misogyny, and distrust. Contemporary phenorealism finds expression in revulsion towards minorities, women, and the uh, young. Heideggerianism emerging as spatial hermeneutical orientation of Pope Buddhist thought has, for instance, moved through varying phases of anti-Platonism, anti-Cartesianism, and anti-Hegelianism. The cancer culture as well as political correctness occupy the twin poles of this. Gestures of political correctness can hardly ameliorate this. So I will go to the next section. It's called Peak Oil Philosophy. Peak Oil Philosophy another name for regime change was authoritarian regimes such as that was in place in Iraq and axiomatic lived regimes uh, such as in Myanmar. In his book, Being an Oil, Volume 1, Peak Oil Philosophy and the Ontology of Limitation, Art Hank argues that the transition to fossil fuel modernity replaced the herds of megafauna of the hunter-gatherer worldview and the cyclically harvested grain of the agrarian worldview with a single immensely powerful but quickly vanishing substance, oil. Stan Hag, a young peak oil philosopher, disillusioned with the debt-ridden student economy in the US, broadcast his ideas from his relocated new base in Vattavila, a village in the suburbs of Thiruvannadabhan, the capital of Kerala in India, which portrays as the back of nowhere, as some sort of backyard civilization. Hag propagates his brand of philosophy to uh, aficionados in the US and other parts of the world through his online channel, while sporadically gracing academic conferences. Some of Hag's YouTube broadcasts that touch upon the ideas of Theodore John Kaczynski, otherwise known as the Unabomber, and others such as the anti-Semitic Italian fascist thinker Julius Evola, the right-wing extremist radio host Alex Jones, uh, can be extremely problematic because it relates ideas of obnoxious individuals uh, from the right-wing fringe in the US. Hag is also the author of A Critique of Transcendental Mimology, a peak oil philosophy of truth. The tropical countryside thus acts as a crucible for such extremist propaganda as well as uh, philosophical ideas. The global rural has become even more sequestered and claustrophobic following the opening up of the economies worldwide, making the very term global village into a misnomer. The global rural propagates right-wing values and functions as a hotbed for global right-wing philosophies, 
using social media platforms and other fora. Uh, some of the uh, broadcasts on Julius Evola focus on that particular thinker's dangerous notions on what he terms overpopulation, ignoring the very fact that the speaker operates from one of the most densely populated parts of the world, where he has chosen to stay as an economic migrant. Petty Linkola, according to Hack, is primarily known for his radical stance against overpopulation and his suggestion that democracy is a serious obstacle preventing serious action to prevent the environmental catastrophe. He is one of the only public figure with the guts to acknowledge that the only way to actually take serious action is to bypass the democratic political procedures altogether and to instead install a powerful authority which will install a decline in the global population, economic growth, immigration, and a number of other unspeakably controversial issues through the Green Police, according to Hack. A one-hour lecture by Hack is devoted to the manifesto of the Unabomber, with added portions about Ludism, anti-technological stance, and critics of Bernie Sanders. It calls for a, note, a political revolution that changes political parties in charge, etc., but leaves the technological basis intact. It must be a revolution against modern technology, uh, specifically. About Julius Evola had, says that in the Gita, there is talk of the inner attitude, which transforms the inner war into the greater holy war. It's no coincidence then that Indra and Odin were gods of order and gods of battle. For war could be understood as the battle for order to reign over chaos. Hag is not exactly out of place in Kerala, because in Kerala, the rationalist leader, C. Ravichandran, uh, has also quoted controversy over his comments on the spouses of uh, various celebrities. Uh, this can be for, uh, these comments have in turn led to a split in the free thinkers movement in Kerala. Ravichandran, along with uh, Jordan Peterson, operate as the very ether which shelters a constellation of radical right-wing figures, including Hack. Ravichandran, not unlike Peterson, uh, commands a huge following, especially among the youths. So these gurus and uh, godmen uh, of various religious hues peddling their brands of meditation, yoga, life coaching are too numerous. Cognitive meditation practices can now be accessed uh, using online applications, uh, Aktam Khyanam and Vipassana are various popular brands of this. The crucial question here pertains to the sustainable future, enmeshed as it is in this global network of philosophies. The Kannada writer Yor Anandamurthy has postulated three uniquely Indian earnings. These he called the hungers for equality, the hunger for spirituality, and the hunger for modernity. Anicca and cognitive meditation techniques of uh, meditation uh, uh, try to inveigle people by using this. So, a number of these are quenched by the Heideggerian organicism or the peak oil brand of pluralist sequestered philosophy. Uh, so Ambedkar, for instance, is that the love of the intellectual Indian for the village community is, of course, infinite, if not pathetic. What is a village but a sink of localism, a den of ignorance, narrow-mindedness, and communalism? Heideggerian militaristic ruralism and meditative practice of Anicca seem strangely detached from the iconic political dimensions that Buddhist thought and philosophy in India have acquired. It gives short shrift to the hunger for equality. By discarding Buddhist notions of non-Atman and non-soul and embracing in the state the dizzyingly commanded pinnacle of vertiginous meditative emptiness, the quest for spirituality also finds itself in a rather tame Bohesian labyrinth. As for the third search for modernity, a philosophical concept, no matter how pertinent, needs revitalization and reframing in the context of the globalized, tech-dominated complex ecosystems that dominate present-day discourse. Uh, since it serves no utilitarian purpose, it would be worthwhile to inquire how Anicca and its meditation technique find their popularity from. The meditative practice of Anicca proceeds an alternative to Indic ritual systems of hierarchical domination and their uh, oppression. It also entails an exponential aggrandizement of the ego of the individual self. The self is taken for what it is. Such a subterranean current can be found across Indic material practices, such as the ancient healing system of Ayurveda. Ayurveda, for instance, uh, unlike allopathic system of scientific medicine, has no recourse to technological measurement of uh, various ind indices of bodily functions or metering procedures. This is despite an advanced mathematical know-how that could easily have produced technological implements and indices for the measurement. Ayurveda's aversion to technology seems to draw from an insistence that the body be healed through the body itself without invasive interference 
from external agents like measuring equipment. The self must coincide with itself. In the realm of the mind also, this meant a healing of the mind through meditation only, where the mind observes and coincides with itself. Such a coinciding of the self with itself reinforces the ego in ways therapy cannot afford to do. It also means a radical eroding of fraternal empathy whereby the I signifies a separation and hiatus from the other. This third other could be the migrant laborer, the starving person, uh, those below the poverty line, the agitators, the less privileged. They are, so all these people become uh, the not uh, me, the not self. So I am not the other person, I am myself. The self reinforcement techniques of meditation this purpose to bloom proverbial lotus from the surrounding. Offering. The Indian middle class recedes into outer space, as Aaron Thidro has said, on the wings of meditative self aware bliss. The therapeutic aloofness on a mass scale, which is supposed to engender vibes conducive to peace and happiness, can also create uh, isolated biases of affluence. Cognitive militarism, in the guise of global philosophy, acts as an extreme instance of correlationism that takes things literally. The meditative principles of Anicca, coupled with the philosophy of new materialism, spawns the militaristic communitarianism that has become the new opium of the internet in the form of Jungian evangelists uh, like your Jordan Peterson. India, as a spiritually effulgent civilization, is sure to find its material poverty rather glaring in the light of meditative globalization. As a result, the aspirational elite who swear by meditation to bliss also prop up the culture of consumption. The materialism of meditation along with the cognitive tangible aspect of object affections combine the essential qualities for cognitive mass hypnosis. Uh, so under this regime, studying a rank's brain is philosophy, but doing Hegel is comparative literature. The philosophical preoccupations of the academic ivory tower bastions are supposed to have favored cognitive militarism that combines Teutonic uh, Germanic militarism with analytic philosophy's exclusive fascination with the mind and consciousness research. So uh, just like the intentional fallacy suggested by Wim Satya and Beardsley and its utilitarianism under which origin the humanities are so to be effaced from public universities also serves to elevate instrumental rationality as the new deity. For instance, an academic like Peterson would claim to work with the people as justification uh, for working on the ground. But Petersonian instrumental reason proliferating through various media as a well-calibrated notion strives to be a substitute for real action and change on the ground. The micropolitics and pragmatics, on the other hand, serve to produce tangible results and hence have an impact which intentionality lacks behind it, actually. Yeah. Umar, if I could yeah, just yeah. request you to wind up another uh, three minutes, maybe. Okay. Uh, so. Thanks. All this coinciding of the self uh, with the self unfortunately occur in a nation where a significant part of the population is hierarchically or numerically castigated in such a way that humiliation becomes a fact of life. Normalized like much of the everyday violence, this new normal of everyday humiliation resonates with the newfound reality of cognitive militarism. The everyday humiliation disables the subaltern from inhabiting the corporeal body. The anomic suicides of various student activists, gender and religious minorities and women are cases in point. Multiple loss of everyday humiliation disable the cognitive apparatus from inhabiting its own embodied manifestation. And Rohit uh, while uh, we are still uh, fresh in our minds. The cognitive uh, meditative corporeality is a luxury that the subaltern is not afforded. So at the same time, uh, much like the bourgeois cognizantly, the vanguard is also well-read and experientially aware of the cognitive taste of our times. An impossible situation that presents itself for the talented and extremely perspicacious individuals in subaltern groups find that they are misfits even under the egalitarian regime of cognitivism. They are entering misfits within the wider ecosystem of peaceful coexistence. So academics and scientists from the sciences and humanities leading cutting-edge research on cognitivism would rather do well to get the students to get on the possibility of such luxuries as a non-alienated existence, which demand tangible and intangible resources in huge unethical proportions. To be alienated and to be cut off from oneself is not to be sought as goals in themselves, but in this infinite universe of performative karma, let's not be content for who we are, since it's enough to account for what we do. In the contemporary cognitive literature, which is fast gaining ground in terms of its popularity, self-narratives are also to be pitted against the practice of Self narratives are pitted against the against the practice of uh, translation. The self, in the sense, is that which is produced as the result of a process of self narration or autopoiesis. As Maturana and Varela would say, what is foregrounded in cognitive militarism is not poetic subjectivity, but rather an instrumental subjectivity in the form of auto narration and self apprehension in the form of self narratives. Accordingly, there is no need per se. Uh, 
for translation since the self would narrate itself as an auto affecting self propelling mechanism so there is no need for therapy also uh, like sartre would say it's bad faith uh, you blame someone else for your issues so uh, the self has to coincide with itself not with the father figure or something outside of itself using jung patterson's muggles in anichi in uh, traditional communities he says of inspired imitation of the actions of that primary personage modified by time and abstracted representation retains primary and potent force even in revolutionary cultures such as our own peterson's onwards the action of the pre experimental man consists of ritual du duplication and simultaneous observation of taboo uh, action bounded by custom when such a man endeavors to produce a particular and he follows an exemplary pattern this pattern was established by his ancestral progenitors in a time subsuming all time and in a divine actually communitary intra psychic time peterson since the self and its subjectivity are easily available and accessible across borders the changes in linguistic ecosystems are only a matter of gradation there is no need for translation this gradation of languages is a function of space since at any one point on the globe there is no incomprehensibility between languages kannada speakers are apparently seamlessly intelligible to tamil speakers at the bangalore hostel border for instance so uh, the subject and space also coincide uh, with each other so uh, subject and space become the primary uh, issues so i'll wind up here thank you so much uh, thanks so much kumar again i'm uh, to apologize for uh, requesting you to hurry up we are all time bound here uh, so uh, can i request the um, questions to uh, come up if the uh, repertoires could kindly collect those yes sir definitely yeah thank you so much thank you so much for the insightful paper i can see one uh, question in the chat box so i'm just going to read it for sir is anicha essentially a weapon of the underprivileged or the different marginalized communities or can it be used by all is ajit sir available is he online hello So this is the question for Umar, right? Hello. Yeah, I guess. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, thanks, Devu, for that question. So, uh, I don't think Anicha is uh, particularly a, uh, essentially a weapon of the underprivileged. Uh, no, that precisely is what I was trying to convey. Because uh, Anicha, Anatta, Dukha. So, uh, these modes of uh, Buddhist enlightenment are not available to. Uh, everyone uh, they are they are not weaponized they are cognitively weaponized but they are not made made available uh, to those people who are in need of that for example uh, dr b r ambedkar would for instance say that uh, uh, the anatma he would contradict anatman and he would in fact posit an atman uh, so in the sense that uh, anicca for instance um, uh, you when you attain enlightenment it is, it is it is like a going up in hierarchy rather than a falling down in hierarchy uh, so in that sense uh, even though in the bodhisattva figure there is a coming down uh, in anicca anatta dukkha and in the enlightenment bliss meditative bliss uh, the uh, there is a vertical going upwards rather than a hierarchical coming down so in that sense uh, uh, the question is not whether it weaponizes the underprivileged but uh, you know whether uh, processually uh, whether whether it's a coming down process or it's an enlightenment is a coming down process or it's a hierarchically you know uh going up process of course there's an aspirational factor here but at the same time uh, uh, it in no ways uh, weaponizes the underprivileged in the sense that it's not an enabling system there is no archive of anicca since uh, it's an emptiness so uh, it it doesn't create an archives of anicca where you can you know speak to the archive so uh, in that sense also uh, anicca is an emptiness anicca the ab the absence of desire of icha of or, or anicca so that leads to Uh, is objective uh, destitution uh, so which can even be traumatic uh, so yeah i guess that uh, answers your question devo thank you so much for that yeah thank you so much uh, i think we can take more in the comments section itself oh, sure. and yes uh, over to you abhishek sir yeah sure thank you very much uh, that was again very interesting and what's really fascinated to see is how the papers seem to be sort of dialoguing with each other so i should congratulate the organizers for paneling it i know it's a really difficult and sometimes thankless task uh, putting people together in the same panel but it's just such amazing dialogue across the papers so the final speaker 
in this session is uh, Urpita Sen, who is an Enfield scholar uh, in the Department of English DU. And the title of the paper is Seeking a World of Their Own, Looking for Human Rights in a Mechanized Futuristic World. So uh, Urpita, if you're ready, could you kindly start your session? Thank you so much. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, good morning to all. Uh, so I will try to stick to the time limit. I will try my best. Uh, so yes, let me begin. Uh, robots, androids, humani humanoid, cybernetic organisms are part of a larger collection of wholly or partially uh, artificial organisms. And they occupy a large space in the vivid and imaginary world of science fiction narratives. They appear in very widespread roles. And yet in most narratives, just as they gain self-awareness, sentience, along with advancing intelligence, they are quickly considered threats. Their rights are non-existent as they stand, and even the basic right to be alive is taken away from them under the guise of human preservation. Though Patricia S. Warwick believed that science fiction creates an image of reality as reality itself, reality is not currently perceived. According to Pierre Th Thomas, however, science fiction deals with a dark future that is often looked upon both as a representation of current society and as a lift possibility. Thus, there is a need to pay a particular attention, as Darko Suben says, to these alternative worlds rather than dismissing them as inconsequential popular fantasies, as they often are. This paper will explore the question of rights of robots, androids, that is, I call them non-humans, and consider the ethical implications of having these non-humans in the worlds, in the world that exists within the narratives of Asimov's The Bicentennial Man, HBO's Westworld Season 1, and Philip K. Dick's To Android's Dream of Electric Sheep, by examining whether or not there exist human rights for a non-human who may be sentient and may indeed be indistinguishable from a real human being. Science fiction often de uh, develops seemingly new worlds and uniquely alternative existences. Most of the narratives are based on hypothetical futures of Earth, where each future has a different environment in terms of political and social climate. However, in most versions of these worlds that are described, humans are accorded certain rights, which are theirs by birth. Though there is a series of compromises, of course, such as laws and regulations that these human citizens may need to make as part of a social contract to promote peaceful coexistence, but in turn, as part of this contract, citizens are granted various rights, which of course may vary from one, uh, one society to the other, but they have rights. These rights are owed to all citizens and should be undeniable, regardless of the nature of society that they live within. The, nature, the worlds of the science fiction narrative, however, the term citizen takes on a different coloration. A citizen is not simply a being who is a resident. A citizen may also refer to robots, androids, humanoids, cy cyborgs, in short, the non-humans, especially those that have gained sentience or are beginning to. In Westworld, do androids and the bicentennial man, the non-humans have evolved to an extent that they're indistinguishable from real human beings. So much so that the test to detect emotional and psychological differences between semi or fully artificial beings and real human beings are inconclusive. However, freedom to be human and freedom to be at par with humans is denied to them. In the world of Isaac Asimov's short story, which is seemingly based on a future version of the earth, one finds robots whose sole purpose, not unlike the android slaves of, the, to, uh, of uh, Philip K. Dick's uh, book, is to serve and obey the human masters. That is the reason they have been created, after all, for eternal servitude. Karl Kapek, in his play, R.U.R., uh, defines the robot as suggestive of forced labor and unceasing toil. According to David C., with continued uh, use through uh, time, the term came to imply, I quote, all self-contained may be removed remote control artificial devices that mimic the actions and possibly the appearance of human beings. Through the course of the stories and the show, uh, it is observed that non-humans are used to ease the life of humans in both these worlds. In the Bicentennial Man, Andrew cooks and takes care of the house while the androids serve a similar function. In Westworld 2, the hosts are controlled by voice commands and are designed to gratify the desires of people that, uh, that, they, uh, that visit their world, the people, people they call newcomers. This is a quote from the uh, show. They are unable to harm guests, but they, often are, uh, they themselves are often harmed or destroyed. In fact, the terrible treatment of uh, hosts is considered justified by the various humans as they are mere abuse uh, as mere abuse of unfeeling machines with a job to do 
In Philip K. Dix's text, there is a post-apocalyptic future Earth that is presented where the human race has been nearly annihilated. To protect themselves from radioactive dust, most of the surviving human population has immigrated to off-world colonies. From the very outset of the narratives, the readers know the colonial government expects android slaves to remain on Mars and continue doing all the dirty work for humans who have migrated to the red planet. In, course, in the course of rebuilding human civilization, however, the humans in the text have been officially allowed to employ lifelike robots and regard them as objects of slavery. They're even used to entice humans to immigrate. I quote from the text, either as body servants or tireless field hands, a custom tailored humanoid robot designed specifically for your unique needs, for you and you alone, given to you on your arrival absolutely free, equipped fully as specified by you before your departure to the earth, unquote. The Andes are pro projected as slaves who are given to human beings. However, soon it is discovered, when it is discovered that these non-humans are acquiring human-like characteristics and sentience, it is considered problematic. This is why probably the recently improved version of the Android with their new Nexus, uh, Nexus 6 brain that have been given too much intelligence are considered problematic when it becomes apparent that they are not as strictly utilitarian as they were in the past. They are labeled aberrations and attempts are made to put them down. The Nexus, uh, the Nexus 6, when they uh, escape, are viewed as androids who, who've abandoned their servitude. There exist government-sponsored assassins called bounty hunters who, for a fee, of course, retire Andes who escape the colony. A similar fate awaits Andrew until his owner puts his foot down. In cases such as Andrew's, evidence of creativity, as well as any trace of humanity in non-humans, is seen as a detriment to the performance of these machines. In Westworld, we witness it for what it really is. Human beings, though far from perfect, expect perfection from their mechanical uh, self, uh, slaves. Apart from perfection, there is a fear that our own uh, material cons uh, constructions, as uh, David Seed writes, may attack us in some later evolutionary stage. And these mechanized creations and non-humans gaining sentience ought to be considered dangerous. Though Andrew in the text rubbishes this fear, showing us that machines and non-humans like him do not have as much power as the humans would like to portray, as I, he says, for a robot to be dismantled at in the or robot, a robot can be dismantled at any time, unlike a human being whose execution can only follow due law, uh, due process of law. There is no trial uh, required for my dismantling. Only the word of a human being in authority is needed to end me. Since their intelligence is superior in so many ways to the humans, uh, there is also a fear that they may take over the world. It is imperative then that these servants be put back in their proper place. The term Frankenstein complex describes this fear of mechanical men and women, wherein they uh, fear that uh, wherein they fear that the robots and machines could re rebel against their owners and masters and the society would fall into complete ruins. To ensure that the uh, humans remain safe and protected and in control of their creations, Asimov postulated the three laws of robotics. These prescribe boundaries that are hard programmed in a robot's brain and are inviolable. The purpose is to unconditionally protect humans from non-humans and thus make non-humans more acceptable to human society. As Jameson tracks in Archaeologies of the Future, there were was, there was special mechanisms that were deliberately inserted within these, I quote, new beings to ensure their harmlessness by constructing them with a commitment to human life, even at the cost of, your, of their own survival. These laws become a means to ensure that these non-humans are unable to kill or even hurt human beings. In numerous texts, non-humans are bound by laws that bind them to an existence that they may not wish to live. Though they are part of society, yet they have no rights, nor an equal claim, uh, nor a claim to equal citizenship. The rights one would reserve for humans are missing for them. In fact, David Seed believes that in the bicentennial man, there's a, I quote here, there is a running analogy between the robot and an African-American, thus ending, thus the ending when Andrew strives for recognition as a man is loaded with racial as well as humanistic significance. Uh, I unquote. There, is, there are constant references made to the unspoken assumption that only a human can uh, enjoy freedom. Donald Palumbo agrees that Asimov employs the dynamics of bigotry in the service of storytelling, uh, but makes a statement, but also makes statements about prejudice. 
after all there are strict laws that robots must follow while hum that humans are not bound by these laws additionally also serve to prevent a shift in the power nexus since there is a fear that it may lead to a complete breakdown of the opposition between natural and artificial that may be inherent in the deep destabilization of the human android hierarchy however the fear of destabilization does become a reality when in west world the hosts begin to fight back to stay alive in fact as amanda de polo contends the ending of westworld the first season shows the potential failure of the three laws of robotics as the non human fights back they are even able to make their own decisions and override instructions though eventually brought under control what is more fearful is that the familiar world order could be destroyed and either wiped off or lead to humans being enslaved by robots this law uh, last thought provides a justification for the hunting and destruction of non human hosts in westworld this is also the case in do androids punitive actions and rule based re uh, restrictions like the laws of robotics present boundaries erected by humans to restrict non humans these boundaries prevent these androids uh, robots from becoming more human like or so the authors would like to a project these boundaries represent a fractured social contract i uh, argue for uh, non humans who unfortunately exist in a predominantly human society however just as worlds evolve machines will evolve, evolve to it is inevitable that a large population of non humans would re uh, remain insentient and oblivious of uh, of suppression for long how however among the many reasons that uh, cited by uh, humans to keep non humans out of the fold of uh, mainstream society is that they are not like us which is due to society's structure being premised on defining ma the manifestation of a particular form of difference one may be reminded of the similarities with mary shelley's frankenstein where readers witness the apathy of humans towards that which looks different we are constantly reminded that the creature of frank uh, the frankenstein uh, the creature of frankenstein is a monster because he is not wholly human and that is acceptable that it is acceptable to deny him love and basic rights such as humans uh, such as freedom and privacy he is shunned and cast out of society similarly in these narratives human rights are violated almost as a rule the problem arises mainly from the definition of human in human rights the entire premise of hurting a machine is that, that they would not even feel pain sheryl wind writes the question of what it means to be human a question generally uh, explored through the constant opposition that is created between authentic human beings and various artificial beings made to uh, imitate humans and uh, the question uh, so as evidence uh, so this binary exists as evidenced by the history of earth uh, racism casteism xenophobia all point towards a very human tendency to demean those who are different who are not like us in westworld too so uh, non humans are seen as the other as they are manufactured and are not natural born humans they are uh, attacked and yeah, tortured just, uh, if i could just request you to wind uh, up in a couple of minutes yes i am trying my best hey, i'm yes. so sorry to interrupt no but... no no worries i will try my best yes uh, i just have three paragraphs to go please allow me that much time oh, um, sure. ahead, yes. yes so they are attacked and tortured and the inhuman actions of the guest uh, guest accentuate the gulf between the human and the non human as the paolo tracks in her essay the violence and disregard for the host especially female is a mere photo op for the humans uh, after all there is a belief that exists that hosts are inherently dehumanized even if they look human the presence of this uh, the difference uh, between the humans and the non humans is stated as uh, the lack of empathy that uh, in uh, uh, philip k dick's text uh, that they lack a special kind of empathy um, and they have a coldness however uh, in uh, androids there are number of instances where androids appear to be have uh, you know it's it's completely overturned uh, where we see in the um, in the text that there are number of instances where androids appear to have deeper feel a deep feelings empathy and empathy for each other and this extends to encompass even humans so it makes one wonder 
if the coldness or the lack of empathy, is it real or is it an imagined quality that justifies their murder? After all, is it not a human who is creating this narrative? Palumbu uh, argues that though androids cannot exhibit empathy, they do exhibit other human qualities such as anger, self-pity, loneliness, sadness, bliss, joy, vengefulness, fear, curiosity, anxiety, and even love. For we notice a range of human, ex uh, human emotions exist and effective relationships that exist even within the hosts of the uh, West, of Westworld. Most of all, the ability to feel and remember pain. There are true bonds that exist between T Teddy and Dolores, Bernard and his son, and Maeve and her daughter. They feel loss, they feel pain. Dr. Ford does attempt to explain the host's memory, but it, they, their pain makes them very real and indeed makes them more human. To uh, Scott B, having a history and a, a memory of lived experience is a key component of their personhood. Thus, the fact that these machines have the ability to fail is enough to grant them selfhood and uh, rights. Although uh, robots and humanoids uh, exist in a far off time and distant worlds from our own, it is easy to perceive that the forms of differentiation ex um, and otherization exist there too. Uh, that exist in our world. No matter how scientifically ex uh, advanced we may become, human tendencies and idiosyncrasies remain unchanged, or so these narratives seem to indicate. It is social and emotional conditioning that makes us ridicule and deride that we, which we cannot understand. In the in case of these non-humans uh, that are depicted in these texts, this is most easily done because they're just machines. Perhaps the greatest fear is not the fear that they will attack us or do, they do not belong, but how indistinguishable their humanness is from real humans. There is a great fear that the other or the non-human might become one of us. Additionally, there is also, as David Seed indicates, the fear of replacement and being unable to distinguish between the replicants and human originals, and the fear that it may someday be impossible to uh, identify human beings, uh, the real humans. So uh, to conclude, these texts show us a mirror to as to how human society truly is heading towards and probably already has attained the state of apathy and intolerance where differences, mainly the non-humans immortality and intelligence are not celebrated, but become a reason for envy leading to conflict. Instead of considering these beings with senti sentience as abominations and treating them as the other, which historically has been used to justify the mistreatment of an oppression of one group of people by another, the text attempt to show that uh, the way they ought to be treated. It is essential that one remembers that these narratives reflect on the world around us. They serve to challenge the deterministic view of human existence. And though they may be far removed from the world that we live in, they are a startling reflection of human society of times that are bygone and uh, sometimes societies that are current, societies where inequity, uh, inequity and repression amongst uh, classes of citizens reign. Through these narratives, you are also offered a perspective, uh, prospect of radical alternative, which may, may serve as motivation to look for an alternative space, a new horizon within this world. So I conclude here. Uh Thank you very much, Urpita. That was a really interesting uh, session, uh, touching on some very complex concepts of agency, free will, embodiment, and consumption in a sort of futuristic world, which is also relevant uh, to the contemporary times. Uh, so could I request the, uh, the rapporteurs to please open up the questions, if there are any, as I'm sure there will be. Yes, uh, Arpita, wonderful, wonderful paper. As I as I can see, there are a number of questions for you, but I'll just quickly try to uh, pick a couple of them. Uh, so the first one is uh, from the co-host. Thank you, Arpita, for a wonderful paper. What kind of agency do the non-humans seem to employ, if at all, in the restricted circumstances of the text you examine? Does this lack then appear to be a reassertion of the anthropocentrism by the authors slash creators? Arpita, can you please answer to that? I'm sorry, could you please repeat it? Yes, I will try to go Yeah, a little yes. slower this time. Uh, yes. uh, what kind of agency do the non-humans seem to employ, if at all, in the restricted circumstances of the texts you examine? Does this lack then appear to be a reassertion of the anthropocentrism by the authors slash creators? 
so um so in westworld of course uh, they fight back as i mentioned in my paper they fight back uh, initially the very um, they their memories are erased so they really don't have any memory of being attacked and destroyed uh, and abused uh, but in um, do androids uh, they fight back they hide uh, initially to save themselves to protect themselves because they know uh, there are chances there is a chance that they might just be destroyed they will be destroyed because uh, after all they've been created and uh, but after after a while they realize that in order to survive they need to fight for their survival and i think that feeling uh, is even the hosts in westworld they develop they realize that if they just stand by and let humans do whatever it is that they want to uh, want to with them uh, there is no uh, way that they can survive uh, and their existence becomes very important to them i think it they it, it takes on a human human like quality human beings want to live no matter what uh and i think in um in uh, of course in bicentennial man uh for andrew he realizes that in order to survive he must become more and more human so that aspiration for his human uh like he wants to become a human so he, that aspiration is probably his uh, to me it seemed like something that he needs to undertake to be uh like to live as a human being he realizes that only as a human being can he continue to survive in this uh, majority uh, th there's a human majority so that is how he can uh, survive in this world so i think that is something uh, that is something that is uh, explored in the text I, I every time i read these texts there, there's a new uh, aspect that opens up um it, it was there any there was another part to this question could you repeat that again i'm sorry i just I lose track. I read that in the chat box, or I think we should have been talking. Okay. Okay. Mm. Okay. Yes. I think that is all right, Arpita. You can just reply to them in the chat box. Yes, itself. I'll do that. Uh, since do we that. have a tea break ahead, and yeah, uh, there's a tea break ahead, and I want the chair for ending remarks before it, and after that we have a wonderful session, uh, the plenary session, of course, and then there is an exciting day ahead. So over to you, Abhishek, sir. Please. Yeah, it's almost Pavlovian when it said tea break. I was uh, looking around for cooking. <laughs> it's, it's a virtual tea break, so yeah, we're just getting used to this. But thank you so much uh, to all the participants for what has been a really um, fascinating session. That's a very complex uh, philosophical themes. And what really uh, appealed to me as a student of literature and philosophy is how rich the frameworks were in terms of how you're engaging with very complex topics of embodiment, distributive cognition, and active cognition, and of course, locating that in contemporary times, as well as sort of touching across different literary and cultural texts. So congratulations to all of you. And I also congratulate the uh, organizers who are putting together such a wonderful panel. It's been a pleasure uh, chairing the session and I've learned a lot from each session, each paper. So I look forward to engaging with you uh, more fully uh, and over non-virtual tea breaks.